Hello everyone, my name is Jacopo Vivarelli. I am a professor of physics at the University of Sussex. I am a particle physicist, which means I study particles and the way they behave and interact with each other. And what I would like to do today is to discuss one of the tools that we use for our investigations. So I would like to spend the time of this talk to talk to you about the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, which, and the title of the talk is a ring with no load for reasons that will become clear in a moment. So what is the Large Hadron Collider? The Large Hadron Collider <coughs> is, of course, the most, particle, uh, the most powerful particle accelerator in the world at the moment. What it does, like you can see in the animation which is running in the slide, it collides particles, in particular protons, at a very high energy in the center of big machines that try to understand what's happening uh, in the collision of these particles. It is an exciting place. We say for advertisement that it's the coldest place in the universe, and what we mean by that is that the temperature at which we keep the magnets that are used to keep the particles spinning around the accelerator is 1.9 Kelvin, which is 0.4 Kelvin below the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. That is the temperature of empty space, essentially. But at the same time, we also say it's the hottest place in the universe. And by that, we mean that the energies that we achieve in the particle collisions um, in the accelerator are energies that were available naturally in the universe only a few moments after the Big Bang. In that sense, the Large Hadron Collider, and that brings me to the, one of the reasons of the title for my talk, the Large Hadron Collider is really a machine that opened for us the full exploration of energy scales that were not explored before. A little bit like the poor hobbits that had to start from their journey uh, around the Middle Earth, and for them, everything that they were seeing at that point was something completely new, a whole new world just displaying in front of their eyes. The LHC, that's what the LHC has done for us. It has opened a new energy frontier for us to explore, and we're doing that exploration as we speak. That's not the only reason why I've used this title, Why With No Lord? Well, indeed, the um, LHC is a big scientific enterprise that in terms of funding and also of effort in terms of you know, running, maintaining, and developing the accelerator and the detectors require the cooperation of really many countries in the world. That world map that you see is color-coded according to the level of contribution that different countries have brought into the project. And this type of research happens at the European Centre for Nuclear Research in French, Centre Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire, and that's why it's CERN and not E-E-E-R-N-C. Uh, -E -E um, but um, what happens at this, this CERN is a big laboratory uh, at the border, a place at the border between France and Switzerland, and it's really... Um, uh, a laboratory open to many countries in the world, but funded uh, um, by the member states, among which the UK is one of them, and all the major European countries are members, st member states of CERN. The main research which is happening at CERN nowadays is certainly the Large Hadron Collider, but CERN is providing an accelerate, a set of, of, of accelerators, an accelerator complex, which is unique in the world. And other things which are, there are many other experiments which are done there, many other particle physics experiments, but also investigations on how to improve cure of conditions like cancer and others using radiotherapy, for example. And when one does fundamental research, that always comes with spin offs. And CERN has had in the past many spin offs. The most, the one with the, probably the largest impact on everyday life was the creation of the protocol that is used to run the internet. Um, for, that was created by Tim Berners-Lee, which was a British researcher working at CERN. So I have told you that the LHC is the most powerful particle accelerator in the world, that is the hottest and the coldest place in the universe at the same time, a bit of a, uh, an exaggeration, but anyway, and that is the result of the cooperation of many countries in the world. What I haven't told you just yet is what for? Why are we doing this? Why are we launching this uh, gigantic scientific enterprise? 
And I think in one word, what can be said is that simply this is because we want to understand what our universe is made of at a very elementary level, at the basic constituent level. Let me try to understand, to explain and let you understand what I mean by that. If I show you an object like this telephone here, I'm sure no one will have any hard time to recognize the telephone there. And I'm asking you, what is this made of? Um, well, of course, no one will have a hard time uh, recognizing a telephone. Some of us, the youngest among us, may have a hard time to understand how to actually dial a number with this phone, but that's another story. So what is this phone made of? Depending on the framework that you accept as, you know, one, when one dis goes into this journey of why, what is made of, one has always to accept the framework. So depending on the framework that one accepts, I can tell you this is made of essentially plastic and metal for the circuits inside, and you may be happy with that. But if you are a bit more stubborn, then you may ask the question, what are you know, plastic and metal made of? And in this going one level above, one level deeper, very soon you will end up talking about things like molecules, which are the basic constituents of matter, uh, of everyday matter. And of course, I may bring the game one step further and tell you what are molecules made of. And then at that point, you will be forced to dive into the world of atoms, individual atoms. There are complex structures. We know today that these are complex structures. And in fact, I could go one step further and tell you what is an atom made of, and I would answer is made of a nucleus, a hard nucleus, and an electron. And one in the case of the hydrogen atom, or many electrons in case of other um, atoms types. And then you may ask, what are atoms made of? Well, what are nucleus made of? What, what are nuclei made of? At that point, we could go a few steps further, in fact. I could tell you that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. And then protons and neutrons themselves are made of subatomic particles, subnuclear particles in this case, called quarks, up and down quarks in particular. At this point, for the knowledge of things that we have today, we have to stop because the quarks and the electron for what it matters are indeed elementary particles. That means they don't have an internal structure as far as we know today. That doesn't exclude the possibility that the future experiment will discover an internal structure for these particles. But for what we know today, these are elementary particles. They don't have an internal structure. And in fact, we know a lot more than that. We know that these are not quarks, those two quarks, up and down quarks and the electron are not the only elementary particles that are out there. There are more elementary particles, more quarks, charm, strange, top and bottom, and I take no blame for the names. And more things look like an electron, they're called muons and tauons. And then we have a number of particles that mediate the interactions, the forces that um, these particles exchange with, with each other. This picture, this table, these uh, principles that you see in this table in front of you, that is what goes under the name of the standard model of particle physics with one ingredient that is what we're going to discuss in a minute that is missing in this table. But that is the model, the standard model of particle physics. These are what we believe today are the elementary particles which are out. But now, of course, you know, we can be even more stubborn, stubborn like a dwarf, uh, just to stay within the context of the Lord of the Rings. Gimli was one of the most stubborn uh, characters of the Lord of the Rings. But actually, I don't think a dwarf is nowhere near as stubborn as a physicist. A physicist can be a lot more stubborn than, than a dwarf. And that is Peter Higgs. And uh, Peter Higgs is one of the three people that allowed, well, three people, plus others, of course, but the three that give, gave the main contribution, um, that brought us one step further. So we may ask ourselves, what are these elementary particles made of? And now we are going very close to a philosophical level of questions, but there's still one level further that we can go, because 
I think it's fair to say what we can say today, uh, intending this answer in the way I'm going to explain, that these elementary particles are in fact made of what we call the Higgs field. Or more precisely, we should say the Brou Angler Higgs field. For in the name of Robert Brou, um, uh, Francois Angler, and Peter Higgs, which are the people that del that delivered this model to the to the scientific community. So let me first try to explain what I mean when I say that elementary particles are made of the Higgs field. Let me first rephrase the question. When we ask what something is made of, we're essentially asking, where does its mass come from, right? So in our everyday life, for example, in case of, of the telephone we were talking about a bit earlier, or the Lego constructions that you see here, the mass of an object is given by the sum of the masses of the objects that compose it, right? The sum of the mass of the telephone would be the sum of the mass of the plastic and the metal that compose the telephone. Or in this case, the mass of this constructed object with Lego is equal when you put it on a wage, as the example here in the slide is hinting at. The weight is the same if you have the thing assembled or disassembled. So the mass of the object is equal to the sum of the mass of the components. When we go to a microscopic level, the picture becomes a bit more complicated. For example, the example that you have now is what happens if we put a proton on a wage. Now, of course, a proton on a wage is a pretty difficult thing to do, to be honest, but let's assume we can do that. If we could do that, we would measure something, 124 in arbitrary units, that's what AU means in that picture, but if we now would put on the wage the components of the proton, that is the up and down quarks, we would measure a number that is a lot smaller than 124. Why is that? Well, that is because the, en the binding energy, so the energy that keeps those objects together, also contributes to the mass of the proton. According how can a mass and an energy be interchanged? Well, that's easy, in fact. That goes along the rules set by... Uh, relativity and by Albert Einstein in uh, 1905 and then later in the 20s of the, of the, uh, the 20th century. So it's E equal mc, that's what allows you to consider energy and mass in an interchangeable way. So the equation in this case is the mass of the object of the proton is the mass of the components, the quarks, plus the binding energy. But how do we apply that simple relation to an elementary particle? What can I say about an electron? Can I use this equation in any way? Well, because the problem is obviously that if I don't have any components, then the mass of the component is going to be zero. And if I have no components, clearly there's no binding energy because binding of what? If I have no components, there's nothing to be bound. So the question is really, where does the mass of elementary particles come from? Now, I will try to answer this question actually relying on the wonderful work that friends of, of colleagues have done, and it's available on YouTube by the link that you see on the slide. This is just a trimmed version of that video, but I find it extremely instructive. So I'll let that run, and then I will explain you what's going on. The Higgs theory starts with this. Imagine a field that permeates the entire universe. And every particle uh, feels this field, is affected by this field, in different amounts. So some particles are really slowed down by interaction of this field, like you know, swimming through molasses, and other particles hardly feel it. So the ones that hardly feel it, they uh, have a small mass. The ones that are really affected by it, they couple strongly to this field, are slowed down a lot, they have large mass. So you've So let me recap what this is about. Let's assume we manage to have two different regions of space. One on the left, where we can switch off the Higgs field, and one on the right, where the Higgs field is switched on. So the one on the right would represent our universe, the one on the left represents something that probably doesn't exist. 
But in the absence of the Higgs field, all particles are the same. They all have the same mass, and that mass is equal to zero. And you see the three particles in this animation, the photon, the top quark, and the electron, which have very different masses. In absence of the Higgs field, they all have the same mass, zero. In presence of the Higgs field, that is when they enter the region on the right, uh, some of them will interact more with the Higgs field, some of them will interact less with the Higgs field. And the level of interaction with the Higgs field is what gives them the mass. So the photon hardly interacts with the field at all, and it keeps having zero mass. The top quark is the heaviest known elementary particle that gets a large mass, 172 times the mass of the photon. And the electron interacts a little bit with the field, and it gets a very small mass. That's how this works. But hang on a minute. Haven't I just changed the need to define the masses of particles with the need of defining how they interact with the field? So what have I gained, really? Is there any way of understanding whether this Higgs field is something real or whether it's just a theoretical construction? Yes, there is a way, because the prediction is that if the Higgs field is real, there should be a new particle called the Higgs boson, which would correspond to the excitation of the Higgs field pretty much the same way the photon corresponds to the excitation of the electromagnetic field. And this is the prediction that gave to these guys, Francois Angler and Peter Higgs, not to um, Robert Proulx, which unfortunately passed away earlier than 2013, which gave to those two people the Nobel Prize in 2013. A very nice story, but I think I haven't made a single step ahead in trying to justify why colliders are a relevant tool in particle physics. So let me now dive into that. The point is we have a prediction. There should be a new particle, the Higgs field. How do we prove whether that prediction um, is uh, satisfied or not? So what do colliders allow you to do? Well, colliders are wonderful tools where um, you can put together, smash particles together and put together a given amount of energy that tends to quantum mechanica, what can be used by nature to give you particles that were not necessarily a reshuffling of what on thin. So if you smash one against another two cars, what you get out of the collision is really just pieces of the two cars. If you smash one against the other two protons, you may actually create from this collision things that were not there before. And the energy is really like, you know, a currency that you trade. You can produce anything that amounts to that much energy or less, like when going to a quantum restaurant. So you have a little animation here of two protons smashing against each other. And this is, of course, just an animation, but they exchange a little bit of energy and they produce things which were not there before. In this case, two top quarks. So if you want to create a Higgs boson, you need to put together at least as much energy as it's needed to produce a Higgs boson. So as much energy as is needed to give mass to the Higgs boson. So if you put together this much energy, then there is a chance that a Higgs boson will be created in, high energy, in a high energy particle collision. There is a chance that that happens. But that's not given for certain, not at all. In fact, Smashing together two protons to get a Higgs boson is pretty much like smashing together two very cheap cars. Some of you may recognize Fiat 500, which was one of the main products of Fiat in the 70s, really a car that was produced in so many um, types and in so many uh, models. And when you smash, it's like, it's if like, if you smash two of them together, you get out of that a brand new, super expensive Mercedes, the, you know, the most fancy of the elementary particles, the Higgs boson. This is impossible, 
right? I mean, in this, no one has ever happened a collision like that. As I tried to point out earlier, in the quantum world, in the microscopic world, that is not impossible. That is just unlikely. And I will try now to quantify how unlikely that is. Now, you may wonder why, in a physics talk, I have a picture of the Brighton Beach. It's a pretty old one, as you would notice from the uh, Brighton wheel being still there. But this is to say the Higgs production is a very rare event. How rare? How unlikely? Well, uh, let's make the following um, experiment. Let's assume two people go to the Brighton Beach in any place between the Brighton Marina and Shoreham, so to say, and they pick up one pebble. They look at that, they put it back. The likelihood that the two people, just by chance, go to the beach and pick the same pebble is roughly the same probability that you have to produce a Higgs boson in a, in a proton-proton collision at the energies of the Large Hadron Collider. So that's a very small chance. And unfortunately, there's no fancy way of, of just doing it, of being able of achieving that. One has just to try lots and lots of times until that one thing happens. So this brings me to discuss a little bit more in detail the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider, as I anticipated, is a particle accelerator being about, on average, 100 meters underground uh, at the border between Switzerland and France in the region of the city of Geneva. There are four main experiments. There are actually... Uh, few more than four, but four main experiments that look at the collisions produced by, um, by the Large Hadron Collider. To give you the parameters of design of the Large Hadron Collider, the Large Hadron Collider was designed to have an energy of 14,000 times the mass of the proton, which at the time was thought to be enough to produce the Higgs boson. In fact, it was. But with respect to the rate of interaction, it, in, it makes protons interact a billion of times per second. So if you now take these numbers and you do a bit of pen and paper calculation, you realize that this is enough to produce a Higgs boson every two minutes, which is good. It's enough events to actually discover and then study the Higgs boson. So how does this work? The protons go under several stages of acceleration using former you know, um, cutting-edge accelerators at CERN, which are now just used as injectors of the main accelerator, which is the Large Hadron Collider. And then the protons are accelerated up to the energy of uh, 6 .6 TV at the moment, 6.5 TV sorry, at the moment in the center of mass. And here we will ride the proton at a speed which is much lower than the actual speed of the proton, which is the speed of light. And you see the three quarks dancing inside the proton and the proton then traveling against the other proton as smashing in the center of the particle detectors. The many particles come out of the collision. Here are the particles coming out of the collision. And the work of the particle detector is to reconstruct those particles coming out of the collision and trying to understand from those particles what actually happened in the primary collision. These are the particle detectors. This is ATLAS, the particle detector for which, where, where I work. And it's itself a collaboration of 3,000 scientists. And the size is 20 meters high and 40 meters long, as you see from the picture, where it's in scale with respect to the, to the people, more or less. The other um, competitor of Atlas is CMS. It's much smaller, a much, much heavier. Still, it's a collaboration of a large number of um, scientists, about 3,000 as well. And just to give you an idea, this is a small fraction of the CMS collaboration. There are probably a few hundred people in this, um, in this picture. 
and that is a photo in scale of the CMS detector. So that's what we are talking about as a scaling number of people and also with respect to the size um, of these detectors. It's the working of these collaborations is quite amazing. Um, there is a hierarchy, of course. There, are, there, there is a hierarchy. There are people that decide what happens, but those people need to gather the consensus of the rest of the scientists. And there's no real power that they have on these scientists. It's not that they pay their salary, right? My salary is paid by the University of Sussex, and I work at CERN. The person that is above me at CERN comes from some different university that has no real power on what I'm doing. They, they, they gather my willingness of participating in a specific investigation when that investigation is scientifically valid, scientifically sound, and interesting. So that's the process that leads to the decisions within these collaborations. It's based not on real power, but on scientific validity, scientific value, and on the consensus that can be built around uh, specific decisions. Quite interesting, and that also goes into the direction of the no lord, which I have in the title. And what do we do? Well, now I'm going to cut this very brutally to the, to the core of what we do. What we do, we measure energies of particles, kinematic quantities of particles. And from there, we can build somewhere, somewhat coming from the E equal M um, mass times the velocity of the, um, uh, of the speed of light, the velocity of light squared, following this relation, these energies that we measure and the mass of the particles where those energies come from are connected. And in fact, when we will plot those uh, energies, like you see in, in this graph that you have in front of you, what we would observe, what you have on the y-axis here is the number of times you measure a given energy or a given mass, and on the y-axis the value of that specific. And you see that the in corresponding to the particles that we know about should be there, we see spikes. And that's what we are looking for many times when in our experiments. We are looking for spikes in these type of distributions. Now, I'd like to show you what is the distribution, the built-in time. Now, we are running over 2011 and then 2012 and accumulating collisions one after the other. And if you look at these mass spectrum, you see no spike, but you see the slowly a very tiny small bit at 125 GV, there is a small bump that is there. I mean, it's very small, but it's definitely there. And today, I mean, with many more data than what we see here, that bump is in fact gigantic. That is the evidence of the Higgs boson. That's what certified that the Higgs field is real and certified the mechanism through which elementary particles, most elementary particles, get a mass. I'm really getting to the end. I want to make a last comment. Of course, the Higgs boson is one of the key elements in our understanding of the universe, but there is so much more out there. We know that our universe was created in a catastrophic event roughly 13.5 billion years ago, and uh, it evolves, and then it left a number of footprints that our friend cosmologists have measured. And there are a lot of mysteries that still we don't understand. We don't understand the origin of dark matter, which is probably, very likely, the dominant component of matter in the universe, which is completely not predicted by the standard model of particle physics. We don't know where the striking asymmetry between matter and antimatter, why do we have a universe made up of matter rather than you know, a symmetric situation between matter and antimatter. We don't know why that is. There are lots of questions around and that are really looking for an answer. And LHC is really only one of the tools that particle physicists use to get to those answers. And let me leave you with just one comment. The exciting part of this job is that it's always like a journey in a new territory. It's a territory that now, after a few years of the LHC running, we may have seen already. But every time that we get there, every corner, there may wait a new road or a secret gate. And we may have passed by already 
But then at some point, we might be able to see what the data are telling us. And a good discovery uh, and good answer to one of the mysteries of our universe may show up in the data of the LHC. And so or there or in any of the other experiments in particle physics systems. So I would like to leave you there. I thank you very much for listening to this talk and goodbye. Well, we hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, I've got to ask, if you did enjoy it, please give the video a like and subscribe to our channel to see our future updates. If you're interested in the future talks we've got coming up, do visit our website at bit.ly slash Universe. And remember, if you're watching live, the live Q&A starts now at the Zoom link in the description down below.